Well, good morning, folks. And welcome to Worship at Bohelvi. And if you're a visitor with us or we haven't seen you for a while, it's really nice to have you back and worshipping with us today. I know we've got at least one visitor from the Middle East, so it's great to see you, Olivia. Glad you can come today. Um, not much in the way of announcements um, other than to say that I think it's Shona Taylor's birthday today. But looking around, I'm not sure that Shona's here. But we'll sing her happy birthday anyway, and she can listen to it in the video. <laughs> you ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Shona. Happy birthday to you. And I forgot to ask if there was anyone else who had a birthday today. Anyone else today? No? This week? This week? Well... No worries, I didn't miss anyone then. That's good. So no, uh, no other bulletins for you other than to say um, I am at work this week, but then I'm going to be off the next two Sundays. That's not an excuse not to come to church. Um, you'll have uh, Ian Groves, who's very good. Ian was the minister at Inverurie West. Uh, Ian's a very good, good guy, capable uh, speaker, great minister. Uh, retired now, so Ian's coming the first Sunday. And the second Sunday, as an old friend, he'll be doing the service, Valerie Mitchell. It'll be nice to have Valerie um, back in, in church with us the second Sunday we're away. So that's all I have by way of announcement. So let's begin our worship this morning in the words of hymn number 252, as a fire is meant for burning. Let's worship God together. Let's join our hearts together in prayer now. Let us pray. Living, loving God, we come before you with gratitude in our hearts and praise on our lips, offering you not just our worship, but our whole selves. Out of your fullness, you brought your human family into being, formed us, birthed us, 
nurtured us, taught us, forgave us, redeemed us, saved us. Thank you that your grace and mercy are sure, your love unfailing, your generosity unbounded, your judgments just and fair, and always for the ultimate end of bringing your creation into the fullness that it was meant for. You are God. You are good. In you there is no shadow of darkness whatsoever, and we can trust you completely. God of grace and mercy, as we take time to be still in your presence, we reflect on the times when we have not relied on your word or your wisdom, when we've not shown any concern or compassion when we should have done so, when we've not loved our neighbor as we love ourselves, when we've remained silent, when we should have spoken up and spoken when we should have kept silent. Father, forgive us and lead us into better ways of living. God, as we set aside this time to intentionally be with you and hear you through the word of Scripture, we ask that you open our eyes and our ears to know that you are here with us this morning and that you open our souls to help us make our own response to you. These things we pray in Jesus' name, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 24, and reading verses 10 to 28, and Jeanette Lamb is going to read for us. In today's reading, Abraham is making plans to find a bride for his son Isaac and decides to send his most trusted servant back east to find him a wife from among his own people. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all kinds of choice gifts from his master and he sent out and went to Aram Naharim in the city of Nahor. He made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water. It was towards evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O oh Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to your master Abraham. I am standing here by the spring of water and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. Let the girl to whom I shall say, please offer your jar that I may drink and who shall say, drink and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this, I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Before he had finished speaking, there was Rebecca, who was born to Bethuel, son of Malkah, the wife of Nahar, Abraham's brother, coming out with her water jar on her shoulder. The girl was very fair to look upon, a virgin whom no man had known. 
She went down to the spring, filled her jar, and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, Please, let me sip a little water from your jar. Drink, my lord, she said, and quickly lowered her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw, and she drew for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether or not the Lord had made his journey successful. When the camels had finished drinking, the man took a gold nose ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels and said, Tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, son of Malchah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, We have plenty of straw and fodder and a place to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness towards my master. As for me, the Lord has led me on the way to the house of my master's kin. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Amen. Thanks, Jeanette. We're going to remain uh, seated for this next hymn. It's number 27, I Will Always Bless the Lord. Let's take a moment to pray together. 
Yet for those who wait on God, good will not be lacking. Wait, yes, in the sense of what we're doing this morning and giving this time over to be with you and to hear from you through the, the, the words of the songs, the prayers, the sermon, and just simply in being together. But wait also in the sense of service. The Father, if what we do here today is simply to, to pick us up or give us a boost for our own living, that's well and good, but that's not the whole story because we are your hands, your voice, your eyes, your arms, your feet within this world, and you call us to live out your presence in the midst of all of our living, and that's service. So we ask you today to touch our hearts and minds as we listen to what you're bringing us through these words and through this ancient story, and bring it alive and anew for us today through your Spirit and into all our living because we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I wonder what you make of stories like this one. The Old Testament is peppered with them, and when we read them, it all seems so easy. God speaks clearly, people respond or don't respond, and things work themselves out, for good or for ill. And that's all well and good. But right off the bat, it begs a question. If God interacted with people so directly back then, why doesn't he do the same now? Or does he now? Now, I've looked at this before with you on Sunday mornings, and I don't intend to go over the same ground today. But let me at least quote one of my favorite authors, Brad Jersak, who's very good on that question. Okay, says Brad, you say you never hear from God. Do you have a Bible? Have you ever read any of it? Have there been verses or stories that have spoken to you over the years? Well, that's God communicating with you. Have you ever been to a church service? I think a few of you here have. Huh? Have there been times over all those years of Sundays when something that's been prayed or preached or sung or shared has felt like it's exactly for you in that moment? Well, that's God speaking to you. Do you know any other believers? Have you ever picked up on anything valuable about the spiritual life from listening to their experience? Well, that's God reaching out to you. Have you ever listened to your own conscience? Have there been times when you've acted for the good because you felt led to, or you've stopped yourself going down a bad alleyway for the same reason? That's God's Spirit impressing Himself in you. Have you ever felt strongly about something that matters? An injustice? or a desire to make something good happen, or a deep concern about a situation that's become unworkable. That's God making his will known to you. The truth is, says Brad Jersak, God's trying to get through to us all the time in many different ways. The problem is that most of the time, we just don't do a great job of hearing him. Now hold that thought but park it for a while because it's not where we're going today, but I think it's always worth getting a wee reminder. And I have to confess, I've been a wee bit naughty this morning because I've started out focusing on how God speaks to us. But when you look closely at the passage that Jeanette's just read to us, God doesn't actually speak to anyone at all, as far as we know. Now, that might take you by surprise. But if you go back and read it again, you'll see that that's the case. Maybe you had the impression that this was some kind of two-way conversation between the servant and God, but there's actually little in the text that points in that direction. Rather than being led supernaturally, like the wise men following the star, the servant was led to this place by his master's orders and by his own common sense. Abraham wanted the best for his boy Isaac, the son that he and Sarah had had so late in life, and marrying Isaac into the tribe of the Canaanites, the neighbors that they were eventually going to supplant, 
wouldn't be wise. Better to find a girl that they could trust without all of that baggage, a nice girl from back home. And so the servant sets out with a plan that trusts in both logic and God. Head back to the homeland. Go to the places where you're likely to find single girls. That sounds a bit dodgy, I know. (laughs) Where do the single girls hang out? At the well. There's the logic. But beyond that, trust in God to lead you to the right one, to a girl who will make a good marriage with Isaac. There's the faith coming in, logic and faith. So that's what he does. He uses his nous and he goes about the task with common sense, while at the same time being completely open to God's leading and guiding in the middle of it. And as an aside, Isn't that exactly what we did as a congregation when we set out to do our development program? We used our house, we made our plans, but we trusted in God that we would raise the finance that we needed in order to see the work done, even though it seemed well beyond us. And together, we managed it. But I digress, back to the story. So after many bumpety miles on Camelback, there's the servant waiting by the well outside the city of Nahor, as the day draws to a close. And as they do, every evening, the young women come out in the cool of the day to draw water. It's the logical place for the servant to go to meet a suitable girl. But this is where the faith comes in. He prays, Lord, when I ask a girl to let me drink some of her water, and she goes the extra mile and offers to water my camels for me, let her be the one. And he'd no sooner prayed that prayer And Rebecca appears and does exactly that. And I love her role in this because she did not know a thing about what was happening. She didn't know about any of this. She hadn't heard the prayer. She hadn't been prompted by God as far as we know. All she was doing was going about her business and being herself kind girl who was as beautiful inside as she was outside, offering help to a stranger with no intent other than the desire to help him out. And as I thought about both of them this week, the servant and Rebecca, I realized something. I realized that the magic that made this whole thing work was openness. The servant's willingness to be open to God's leading and indeed to ask for it. And Rebecca's willingness to be open and hospitable to this stranger. The greatest commandment, Jesus said, is to love God and to love neighbor. We had the P5s up, uh, not last week, but the week before. And I was trying to summarize for them what the church is all about. And I said, it's two things. Love God, vertical, and love the neighbor, horizontal. And what shape does that make? Sign of the cross. Love God, love neighbor. But part of the way that we do that is to be open to God and to be open to the neighbor. A disposition of openness towards the other creates a space where God can be at work and significant things can happen. With openness, an everyday meeting can become so much more than that. It can actually become a kind of encounter. And I have a few stories about that to finish with. For the last year, um, I've been offering a couple of hours a week as a volunteer listener for the National Health Service based in a local GP practice. I used to joke with Rona that half the people coming to see her as a doctor didn't actually need to see a doctor. They just needed somebody to talk to. And that joke has come back to haunt me years later because now, after appropriate training, I am that person that they come to see. Now, formally, I'm not a minister in that space. I'm just Paul, the listener. But I pray inwardly for each person coming through the door before they arrive, and I try to treat them with the respect and regard in which they should be held as people bearing the image of God. And all kinds of people come from folk in their 20s all the way up to folk in their 90s. Some I would relate to easily in everyday life, and some are the kind of people I would probably never talk to 
because they're so different. And they bring all kinds of stuff to speak about. Oftentimes, they're in tears before their backside has even hit the chair. And one of the joys of that work is seeing defenses slowly come down over the space of an hour. As you listen and as you ask sensitive questions that help the story to emerge, something changes in the room. You can sense trust developing, people relaxing into it and beginning to open up. And at the end, whether that's after one session or after five or six, people tell me that being heard and accepted and not judged has really helped them. We may not have found all the answers together, but at least it's given them a place where they can be open with someone and begin to make some sense of the difficult things that have happened in their lives. They respond to the openness of that situation with openness. I'd mentioned that P5 came to see us a couple of weeks ago. They came up from Balmedi, walked up the path, took them about four hours to get up from the school. But they came up, and coincidentally, at that very same time, a family from Australia landed in just as we were getting ready to start. And the folk from the church who were helping out that day with... Uh, with catering in the hall, were lovely and open to this Australian family. They took the time to talk to them, to make them feel welcome, and they gave them some resources to help them look for a relative's grave at the old church graveyard. And the visitors were genuinely touched by the effort that our folk had made to make them feel welcome. And they said that they'd never expected to find that when they set out that morning to have a wee look at Bullhelvy Church openness again. And I don't know if you've seen the program Race Across the World. You can get all three series on iPlayer, and it's definitely worth a watch. Six teams of two have to make their way across a huge stretch of land. This last series, uh, series three, it was all of Canada from west to east. They have to keep within a small budget and they have to supplement their income by taking odd jobs when their funds run low. And it was really interesting seeing the different approaches that folk took to the task. And one couple, Zainab and Mobin, were especially good to watch. They were both medics and they were quite different characters. He was laid back, whereas she could be quite spiky at times. But what was noticeable about them was that they reciprocated the openness of the Canadians who stopped to give them lifts or had them in their homes while they did tasks to earn money. They really got to know them and they had good conversations and their experience of the whole thing was far richer because of it. But during the program, we got to learn that Zainab and Mobin were childless despite trying for a family for many years and it was clear that this was something that weighed heavily on them. They spoke about it several times during the series. And then in the last episode, literally just a few hours before the end of the race, they got a lift from a trucker called Brett. And this is what happened. Just think about the openness that made that encounter happen. Brett chose to stop and literally opened the door of his cab to give these two strangers a lift. Mobin had to risk opening up about their childlessness when he could have chosen to keep quiet about it. Brett chose to tell him his own story as an adopted child and shared his view that adopting someone was the highest form of love. And you could see the impact that this seemingly chance encounter had on Zainab and Mobin right at the end of their epic journey as they were gearing up to return home to their everyday lives. And by the end of the show, they were seriously considering going down the route of adoption themselves. All because 
of openness. Jesus taught it, but he also lived it. He was open not only to the righteous, to those like him, to the people he already knew and felt safe with, but to the, the tax collectors and the hookers and the Gentiles and the sick and the sorry and the other open because he knows that people can only receive the healing of body, soul, heart, and mind that's theirs in him if they get close enough to receive it. Open because he wants those who follow him to take that same attitude out into the world with them, to use their nous and their faith to meet people where they're at and find ways to gently open them up to the great ongoing story of God's salvation. You know, on one level, today's reading is just a story of an arranged marriage in the ancient Middle East. A trusted servant selects a suitable bride for his master's son. But on a deeper level, this is a huge part of the outworking of God's eternal plan because Rebecca and Isaac do get married. And they become links in the chain that lead us, first of all, to Israel, God's nickname for their son, Jacob, but eventually through the generations to the Christ himself. They're part of his family tree. So the lesson that we take away, I think, from today's reading is that God's story unfurls in the world Wherever God finds faithful people who are willing and ready to be open. I wonder what our church would look like if we were making a more conscious effort to be open. More open to God. More open to the stranger. To the other. More open to change and to meaningful involvement. More open to learning and listening and showing love in Christ's name. Many of us in ministry are looking around at our congregations and wondering what on earth the future holds as we see them melting away year after year like glaciers in the face of global warming. And I read these words as I was preparing for today, and I don't think I could sum up what I've been trying to say this morning any better. And these words hold both a promise and a challenge for each one of us. The future that God promises is bound up in the acts of people who give of themselves people who are willing to be open to God and to one another. Without that willingness, nothing's going to change. With it, who knows what God might do in us and through us. Amen. We're going to sing together again. It's hymn number 390, Open Are the Gifts of God.
We'll continue in worship now as our offerings are uplifted. We're going to pray together again, make our prayers for uh, the world, for others. And as we do so, there'll be a few pauses in this prayer just to leave you some space uh, to bring the people who are on your hearts and minds or the situation uh, on your hearts and minds to God in silence. So let's pray together. God of hospitality, nobody comes close to you when it comes to offering an open invitation. You invite all to your house, to your table, to your arms. And we pray that all the world would hear and receive this good news. May we remember that no one ranks higher than anyone else in your kingdom. And in remembering this, may we treat each other the way that you treat people. God of generosity, you treat us all with a tender love. And at this time, we pray for our friends, our families, and those who need you more than ever, naming them in our hearts in a moment of silence.
Lord, we ask that you would pour out your healing on all who need it. May you be generous with your transforming love for those who need it in their lives, bringing about reconciliation in families and communities and in your wider human family, where strife and discord so often raise their ugly heads. So, Lord, we lift our world and its many conflicts to you in the silence. God, of all good gifts, you bless us with the gifts of the Spirit to play our part in furthering your purposes and to become the body of Christ in the world. Help us to be open to you and to others so we may continue the work that needs to be done. We take a moment in the silence to commit ourselves to showing that openness in the week that lies ahead. God of grace, we thank you that you are in our lives. Help us to show people through who we are and how we are that your way is open to all. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. We open doors for everyone and breaks down the barriers that trap us, setting us free to begin to know what life eternal is, even now. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 250, Sent by the Lord Am I. And we'll sing this one through twice. Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord.
And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore.